Welcome to the debate at GO8 podcast series exploring issues and research affecting the Group of Eight Universities and by extension Australia's economy and our society. My name's Ron Candelars, I'm a freelance journalist and producer and throughout this series we've been canvassing a range of topics touching upon the work of all the Group of Eight Universities. They include the Australian National University, Monash University, UNSW Sydney, the Universities of Adelaide, Melbourne, Sydney, Queensland and Western Australia. Today we'll be exploring the life and times of Simon Crean, who's currently the Deputy Chancellor of Australia's largest university, Monash. Mr Crean was the Labor member for Hotham and served in the cabinets of four Labor Prime Ministers, Bob Hawke, Paul Keating, Kevin Rudd and Julia Gillard. His ministerial and shadow ministerial career covers a vast array of portfolio areas. Prior to his entry into Parliament, he spent 20 years in the trade union movement, including a stint as ACTU president. This is a man who knows plenty about the cut and thrust of politics and the big issues facing this nation. Joining us for part one of this podcast interview with Mr Crean is Vicky Thompson, the CEO of the Group of Eight Universities. Well, Simon Cream, we've just heard a potted history of your amazing trade union and Labor Party career. You came from a family considered ALP royalty. Your father, Frank Crean, was a giant of Labor politics serving in the Whitlam government. Your mother, Mary Crean, was the matriarch of one of the nation's most famous political families. Your brother, David, was treasurer in Tasmania in the 90s. What was it like growing up in the Crean household? Pretty fantastic place, but because uh, the parents were, they were wonderful parents, but in those days, there was no such thing as an electorate office or electoral staff for members of parliament. So home, in essence, was the electorate office. So what we saw were not just the famous names coming in, um, Arthur Corwell, Dr. Evett, uh, Gough Whitlam, all of the people that became part of the uh, cabinet, uh, Gough Whitlam's cabinet, they came through, but so did the um, local constituents uh, they'd come by on Saturdays and Sundays and uh, have their appointments. So it gave me a very good understanding of the importance of that connection with community. And, of course, in Mum's case, she was very active in the, uh, in the community. She was uh, an incredibly driven woman, a woman of great uh, purpose and uh, commitment, and um, she was involved in everything. So that sense of community engagement was very much instilled in us as well as the personalities that uh, became an important part of that Whitlam government in the 70s. Actually, when you think of it, between my father and myself, there was a Crean in all of the Labor cabinets, short of this one that's now been elected, since the uh, Chifley cabinet. And, of course, David, as you said, was in the state parliament in Tasmania. Neither of us intended ourselves to get into politics, but that's how it happened. Anyone following in your footsteps for future Labor cabinets? No, I've got um, two daughters. Uh, they're very socially aware, and uh, but I think they've seen a lot of what politics can do. They're not that attracted at this stage, but that's not what gets you into it. It's mm. the uh, causes and the uh, the issues that take you there. Vicky. But, but was public service in some way preordained for you? You know, was there an expectation given you know, the family's background, that you're going to serve in some sort of public office? No, no, it it wasn't. Public service and the serving of the public being an important function, that was certainly uh, instilled. But no, no, my political activism really happened as a student at Monash University because I was there at the time of the protests against the Vietnam War, the protests against apartheid, and, of course, what that taught me was activism could have an impact. And uh, so I got caught up with it uh, there. We had to form the ALP club at uh, Monash because the um, Trots and the Maos were fighting over <laughs> a Labor club. So we had to form the ALP club. And it was really my engagement with the trade union movement subsequent to uh, the university days that uh, steered me in the political path. So as much as it looked inevitable from a family perspective, that wasn't the way I got in. I got in because I uh, saw the importance of trade unionism and fairness and fairness and distribution. Of course, that became the story of the Accord. 
Um, but I was fortunate to have gone through at a very salient time in Australia's uh, development. Ambition and the disappointment of the Whitlam experience, um, everyone's expectations being lifted, the whole question of free education in universities, etc., the big representation on the global stage, that was a fantastic period to have observed and been close to observing. The dismissal was a shock, but trade unionism then gave us the opportunity to do what couldn't be done because the Whitlam government wasn't allowed to do it or didn't have enough time to do it to be done at the um, industrial level. Um, superannuation became an important part of that, for example. The strikes around Medicare to ensure that that uh, was saved, these became important linchpins of what the accord subsequently became. Um, and while I was climbing the ladder in the trade union movement and ultimately as ACTU president, that was a fascinating time to have been involved. The political background didn't hurt, but it was actually being at the, the forefront of change, uh, the forefront of progressive and important fairness in distribution, safety nets for people. That was a really, I, I say exciting time, but it really was important for how this country was set up subsequently. Simon, can I just take you back on a couple of those points? So you talked about Monash University, and of course, you've almost gone full circle now, you're Deputy Chancellor at Monash, but you talked about sort of the, the political activism on campus and, and being at a moment in time, obviously, in, in, in that sort of Australia's history. Do you think that there is the same sort of passion on university campuses today as what there was back then and the, 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 the issues are just different, or is it a completely different vibe on campus now? I think the passion is there with uh, young people in a lot of issues, especially around climate change, especially around anti-racism, especially around the um, questions of diversity and recognition of that. The campus being the basis in which the campaigns are run, no, I don't see that these days, but there are other opportunities in which that's expressed. I think that's got also a fair bit to do with the fact that now there are a lot of foreign students and they have a particular focus uh, not around the, uh, the issues that uh, might engage domestic uh, students, but I'm not seeing the same level of act activism. I saw it when the Howard government got in and there were a lot of student protests against what the Howard government was doing in putting university mm -hmm. fees up. I'm not seeing, I didn't see it so much when the universities took a real hit uh, from the Morrison government, uh, quite frankly, particularly during the um, um, COVID. Not that you could see anything no. during COVID, everyone was at home, but in the lead up to it, the concerns about where the education system was going, I didn't see it uh, on campus. And can I also just pick up another point you made talking about the Whitlam era and you know, the, the free education. And interestingly, I was having a conversation with uh, another business person just this week, Ron, and we were talking about free education because it's always on the agenda that, you know, universities should be free again. And this person commented, well, in many ways, that was almost an elitist com concept because if we had free education now, we simply couldn't afford to, to have it. So I'd be interested in your view on free education. It certainly opened up the system, but also you talked about the expectation of the Whitlam government. And I'm wondering whether your just your observations on the expectation after nine years of a conservative government with the Albanese government and whether there's any sort of comparison mm. uh, there in that context. Well, let's just deal with the question of free mm. education because it was a groundbreaking exercise in the Whitlam government and it was affordable at that time because fewer people were going through to complete university entrance particularly women. Now, the participation rate in those days, and this was one of the great improvements under the Hawke government, I think the people completing secondary education went from something like around about 30%, Vicky, up to over 80%. Mm. You'd, you'd have the figures. Mm. 
In those circumstances, free education, so-called, couldn't be afforded without significant um, increases in tax. This is the old argument about expenditure versus revenues. That's how the HEX system became developed. I was president of the ACTU at the time when we had to embrace the notion of uh, HEX. The model at that time that was introduced was a world-leading model. It was commented on by the OECD. It still is in many ways. It still is, mm. but it, it has been, it has had so many changes made to it that it has also caused the circumstances in which higher education has become unaffordable for some. Mm. I think it's true that under Labor governments, we've always grappled with that notion of the importance. We see it as an investment, not a cost, but it's not just a public good anymore. There is a private benefit. And in those circumstances, I've always accepted the notion that there should be something of a contribution so long as it's affordable. We moved to the system in the Rudd and Gillard governments to the demand driven system. I personally believe we've still got to get back to that, but it's not going to happen overnight. But I think we've got to prepare the groundwork by which we see the importance of it. And these days, it's even more important, uh, Vicky. I mean, when I was education minister, we had high unemployment. Now we've got low unemployment, but terrible skill shortages. When I was education minister, we had to get a better match between supply and demand and try and engage the long-term unemployed in particular through mechanisms that got them back into either a job or a training regime, including building a capability to go on to higher education. So I've been through all of the different economic circumstances, surrounding circumstances, and I believe now when you ask me about the Albanese government, I think they get it in terms of skills, because the skills agenda is so important to a growth economy. That's why I say it's got to be seen as an investment, not a cost. I think the previous government saw it as a cost, amongst other things, but I think that's the wrong way to go. If we're going to secure lasting and sustainable economic growth, we have to invest in our people. The big challenge now, I think, is to get a better integration between our school system, further training system, vocational training system, and our higher education system, and have the flexibility, the interconnectedness that can enable people to exercise choices through their working life and not just the university as an entry level mechanism but as a continuing work, um, lifelong learning, if you like, um, concept. And I think there are encouraging signs coming from the government, but it's really important for the sector to advocate sensibly in this area and to identify key policy settings that would facilitate such a uh, transition. Uh, Simon, I, I want to bring... Uh, conversation back to some, you know, we were talking about some big policy, uh, big ticket items here. You were involved at the cutting edge of reform when it came to industrial relations in your role as ACTU president. You talked, you know, also about the Accord. This was also a time when the Hawke-Keating government was transforming Australian politics and the Australian economy. And that reform process has stalled in more recent years. How do we achieve the big economic and political reforms that Australia needs with such a fractured political environment at the moment? I think it requires strong leadership and it requires a sense of a, a, a fundamental understanding as to what the strength of our economy is. The whole game has changed as a result of the COVID circumstances, the impact of China, and of course now with the Ukraine. It's ha what it's having an effect on is supply chains, which is forcing countries to think about how the global economy has now put certain constraints on what they can get. We had it during the COVID environment. We couldn't get face masks. We couldn't get the vaccines. One example of it. The Ukraine situation, of course, has highlighted the importance of energy to a growth economy. But 
all economies now having gone through the COVID circumstances, I've just come back from the US and Canada, they're all experiencing what we're experiencing, that is skills shortages. So there's got to be a reset, but the reset has to take account of what our strengths are. It has to invest in the skills. It has to invest sensibly in internationally competitive infrastructure spends, and you've got to get value from money for what the fiscal settings are, the expenditures are that governments undertake. I also believe, and I keep coming back to this point, Ron, about fairness. The great legacy this country now has is the safety nets around Medicare and around superannuation, quite apart from the minimum wage, which was something that was entrenched way back with the arbitration system. Australia is particularly unique. When you look at the US economy um, in particular, you look at uh, a lot of economies that are struggling now, they have not got the safety nets in place. The Accord was the vehicle that delivered those safety nets and they can't be unpicked. Governments and conservative governments have attempted to unpick them, but there's been resistance and they haven't been able to do it. Superannuation got stalled. It should have been a 15% already. That was the uh, position that was achieved uh, by way of commitment back in 1996, um, but was never proceeded with despite a promise to do so by the Howard government. So I guess what you've got to do is two things. You do have to go for the most effective and sustainable growth model available. That has to understand our inherent strengths. It has to also recognise that we have to be competitive in those industries. We have to help those industries transition. So there have to be transition policies in place. But if there is to be the growth dividend, it has to be distributed fairly. That I fundamentally believe in and I will continue to argue for it because I have seen it work. And it has worked, not just for the benefit, for the benefit of individuals, it's worked for the benefit of setting our country up to be a really competitive and brand-oriented focus, no more so than in the higher education sector. Why do people want to come and study in Australia? Because they recognise the quality of the product that we've got on offer. It is now our, I think, Vicky, fourth largest uh, well, probably not not with uh, the COVID impact, but it was even with, before even COVID. with COVID. I mean, we were set, we were third, and even with COVID, I think we've just dropped to fourth. Even though the yeah, hit, well, we've taken a big hit, but even notwithstanding that, and and Simon's right. I mean, yeah. our international students, particularly at the group of eight, have stuck with us, even though the majority of them have been teaching, uh, being taught online. Mm. So, you know, that's a pretty ringing endorsement. And, and yet there's been a testy relationship, well, there was, between the Morrison government mm. and universities more generally. Do you think that the that they're encouraging signs about the way in which the Albanese government sees this strength uh, in the Australian economy to grow the economy uh, in a fair way for, for all Australians? I think there are encouraging signs, but the dots have to be joined. We have to look at the visa system. We have to look at the integration between the vocational and the higher education sector. We've got to move back to that demand-driven concept. That may take time, but nevertheless, it should be uh, an objective. And we've got to come to grips with this lifelong learning concept. I mean, when I went to university, you had an entry at um, matriculation in those days. That's how far back I go matriculation, but it was an entry, it, it, it was a qualification to enter a university. That's what it was. Hmm. These days, I think we need to find more flexibility in the system that certainly gives more people that opportunity to continue their education or training in some form or other, but to keep coming back to it, to keep looking at the opportunities and the challenges, because we are constantly in transition. The challenge for governments is to how to manage the transition in a way that sustains us. And I think the uh, sort of direction that the government is talking about now is pointing positively in that direction, and we should be doing everything we can to 
support them, encourage them, challenge them, and uh, come up with some sensible policies that uh, they can embrace. We've got a lot to get through because your career is quite remarkable in terms of you know your, your involvement with the trade union movement and then in Labor governments and Labor oppositions. The highs and lows, what are the, what are the big highs for you? Uh, well, the highs uh, clearly are those um, safety nets, those accords that uh, I talked about. If we talk about the higher education sector, I think uh, the commitment to um, additional funding from governments that I've been involved in. I was the science minister that established the Cooperative Research mm. Centre uh, program, which is still still lasting. going today. And and you talk about something that's that's celebrated internationally and as a, a absolute exemplar of university industry engagement. It is the CRC program. And and also with um, the trade portfolio, um, the recognition of the importance of higher education as, as of education as an export. So as a benefit to the economy, not just the individual's contribution back. Uh, I think also the Working Nation program that sought to look at that bigger perspective of skills. We've just got to get our skills lists coordinated better, integrated, uh, work through. I think the reconstruction fund has to be looked at. There's no point reconstructing industry if you haven't got a skill base that's going to service it. So it's a $15 billion fund. I mean, there is an opportunity in which we should be looking at how that funding is used to benefit the organisations that are going to train those people, identifying the skills that are going to be needed in the next, uh, not just overnight, you know, getting people back into uh, uh, the job shortages, but how we plan a skills base going forward. And I suppose also the regional uh, portfolio also taught me the fundamental importance of the higher education sector in terms of diversifying regional economies. You look at the successful regions that have actually managed their own transition at the heart of all of them is a very good university engagement. So I think that there are opportunities here that my experience over a number of portfolios has taught me not just the importance of seeing education and training as an investment, not a cost, but how you can see it as a dynamic in terms of the uh, transition economic agenda that is so important to where our future takes us and uh, how that's going to sustain higher living standards. And the lows throughout this career? (laughs) Well, opposition (laughs) is always a low. Uh, losing the leadership, of the leadership of the Labor Party was a low. Politics is full of highs and lows, and uh, you learn from the lows. But I tell you what, in this game, the highs <laughs> always uh, outdo the lows. And I've been in a fortunate uh, period where, as difficult as times may have been, I still look back with a lot of satisfaction uh, with what I've been able to contribute to in terms of lasting impact. Because that's the test of good policy, uh, policy that can't be unpicked. There will always be attempts to try and unpick it and even to slow it, slow the pace of change. We've got to get back to more momentum. And I think, quite frankly, in the context of the political climate, even though the Labor Party went with a, uh, on the face of it, was seen as a pretty modest agenda, The election result was a strong vote, in my view, for progressive change, particularly around climate, uh, particularly around integrity, and particularly around approaching the transition of our economy in a much more comprehensive way rather than in a divisive way. People are looking for more cooperation, more bipartisanship, something I've always believed in and practiced. But... I think that's that's where we've got to go. And so whatever the highs and lows are, I hope that we can uh, project the notion of uh, what's what's the right policy direction in which we should head. Well, you're Deputy Vice-Chancellor at Monash University. What would you say to a young student contemplating life in politics? Is it worth it? Absolutely. Governments do make a difference. And I think the uh, the last nine years has shown us just how they make the difference. If you've got a government that is not prepared to move on climate change, and we all know we had to move, 
but the political circumstances made it difficult to move. Activism can change it, but we did get a very good result for change at the last election. Uh, the opportunity is there to go. But to come back to your question, you've got to have You've got to see the importance of government, not just be frustrated by it. It's easy to get frustrated by it because of the nitpicking, the sense that people don't see much of a difference between the two parties. Here is the opportunity to really see a new environment in which to push worthwhile causes, have conviction in them, rely on the evidence in terms of making your argument and most importantly, persist with your conviction. Don't be deterred by the knockbacks. So anyone who really is saying, should I go in there? How do I get there? My view is very much to encourage them in the direction. Governments make a difference. Public service is a noble cause, and it does make a, a fundamental difference as to where the country heads. Well, Simon Cream, we'll touch more upon some of these issue, issues in our second podcast with you, and we'll examine your position as Deputy Vice-Chancellor at Monash University and your important roles at the coalface of trade and politics. But for the moment, thanks for your time. Thanks for your company today. If you'd like more information about the issues raised in this podcast or other related topics, please visit our website at go8.edu.au. And a quick reminder that you can always tune in to the debate at GO8 on Spotify, Google, Apple or YouTube. Bye for now.